Hi everyone, Heath here again. What this next video is going to pertain to is we are going to try to demystify some of the different settings and also demonstrate a way to optimize your RIP software for uh, better output and better uh, graphics rendering. All right, so let's get started here. So in our previous video, we went through the basic installation of the RIP software. So what we're going to do now is go through the uh, uh, getting it kind of prepared for printing and kind of explaining your workspaces here. Okay, so going across the top, we'll just start up here in the corner. We have our file drop down menu. You can import graphics here. You can also find files. Uh, finding files is just like a uh, previewer. Uh, what it will preview is like JPEGs, TIFFs, things like that. If I click on there, I can go look in different locations on my uh, hard drive for different types of graphics. Say I want to go to where I have some of my different artwork stored at and I'll go to like downloaded. When I click OK, it gives me all these different file versions. And then it'll populate a list for me. Once it populates this list, once I click on some of this artwork, it'll give me little thumbnails of it. And then I can import them directly from there. But with this, uh, you have to remember that these are like JPEGs or TIFFs or things like that. You will need to edit these files before you actually print them. Okay. When importing a file, you basically just click on import file and you can go look anywhere on your uh, hard drive or external drives, whatever you may have hooked up on your computer. Um, also remember that you need to have some sort of graphic software to doctor these files before you actually import them because the RIP software will only print what you send it. So if you send it a low res, uh, low quality image, it'll give you a low quality, uh, low res output as well. Okay. Um, under our queue drop-down menu, uh, we have Manage Queues. Under here, we have all the different queues, which are also up here on the top of the tab. What these queues represent are the types of shirts that you're printing on. It's basically predefined settings. We have black shirt settings, we have colored shirt settings, and then we also have white shirt settings. Uh, one of the things that you can remember is that, uh, like, once you have these file or these queues optimized, is that you can um, make copies of them so that way you can play around with them. Over here we have what the printer is listed, the DTG Viper, and then the ports that they're connected to. When they list file here it will not be able to output to the printer. We will actually have to connect it to the Epson Pro 4880 port. Once this has been done once, that will be the last time you have to do it. So on this particular computer I have it connected to the uh, the Epson Pro Stylus 4880 and it's connected through the USB port 1. Your number could be different depending on how many uh, USB uh, that, that you're actually using on your computer. Alright, so what I'll need to do is change every single one of these to that port. Once this is locked in, I will it'll always be able to output to the printer. Okay, um, if I install like a second printer as your business grows, then you will probably have different queues and also different USB ports. And then you can label your queues accordingly to that. Over here to the right, it has an install button. Uh, the only reason that you would ever click install here is if you wanted to install uh, I, an actual local printer to your printers and devices that would be listed over here in devices and printers. Uh, the only reason somebody might do that is for an operator to uh, have uh, less control over what the RIP settings do. Uh, so that way you would have a graphics guy and he would um, doctor up the graphics. But this would lock in the settings of whatever these cues are listed at. You would not be able to change them. But you would be able to print directly uh, to Photoshop uh, or from Photoshop directly to a uh, to a printer. Basically my printer would be listed as Viper Black Quality and then it would print out according to what these queue property settings are. So for most, 90% uh, of all the installations that we do, uh, you will not need to click install here. Okay. Um, things that we can do, and we'll actually come back to this uh, queue manager menu a little bit later once we've optimized our queue settings, and we're going to create a couple uh, extra queues that we can uh, kind of play around with for some different specialty type stuff. All right. Next is your jobs uh, drop-down menu. 
Restore Jobs gives you the ability to archive jobs after they've been processed, ripped, and everything like that. Uh, this meaning, so if you have like a repeat customer that you could actually create a uh, an archiving folder and you could name that folder after particular customers and then save your print jobs in there. And when you archive an actual ripped file, that way when you bring and restore that job back in here, it'll be the identical settings, uh, spacing, size, everything. You will not be able to change it from there. So that way if it is a repeat customer and they say they come back to you six months later and say, hey, I want the same thing that I did last time, you'll be able to pull that back up and print it accordingly. Uh, I go ahead and give you this a suggestion that you stay organized from the get-go. Uh, create subdirectory folders within this folder so that way it's easy to find stuff. Okay, moving on. Um, also down through here, all these different buttons are grayed out because I do not have a job imported at this time. Um, most of the time during the printing process, I usually never use this drop down menu. Uh, I can get it uh, get to all these different selections by either right clicking on the job or using these little uh, buttons up here at the top of your screen. Okay, next one over is your device drop down menu. Um, under there, uh, the first heading here is Manage Devices. This is how many printers I have hooked up to this particular computer. Right now I only have the DTG Viper hooked up. Okay, so from here I can add a different printer if I buy, say, an M2 later on to speed up my production. I can always check for updates in here. So if I click on the, uh, on the actual uh, device driver, then I can click on check online for updates. What it will do is check for any updates. Uh, if it does not have any, no harm, no foul. But if it does, it will automatically update and uh, this little check mark will come up and you will click update device. Uh, there will be some updates coming up. Uh, today's date is uh, May 10th, 2013. Um, so keep checking on these. It never hurts to always have the most up-to-date builds and up-to-date drivers for your software. All right, next under the device menu, you have manage print modes. Print modes are basically uh, the the way it's going to render the graphic, how fast it's going to print, the quality of the print, and those type things. Whether you're printing to black shirts or color shirts, or you can adjust your under bases, or you can do white ink only print modes. And we'll uh, kind of touch back on this once we get into uh, defining what the Q settings are. Okay. Also under devices, we have manage print media. All right, these are the templates that you print to. We have all these default print uh, templates, but these three are the main defaults that you're going to be using. Uh, we do have the exclusive Floor 2-1 Platin system uh, for the DTG Viper, uh, the 4-up, the 2-up, and the 1-up, uh, and then we can make changes accordingly from there. All right. And I'll actually go in a little bit later and show you how to create like a special template for doing like two of the same job uh, on the two up platen or even the four up platen. So that way when you import one image, it drops it into both slots or, or all four slots. And then when you make changes to the scaling uh, position, it changes it on all four platens or all two platens. Next, uh, we have printer properties. Uh, under printer properties, you can kind of monitor what those dummy ink chips on the back of the machine are. This doesn't actually show you the physical ink that's in the bulk ink system. Uh, as you've probably seen during the setup, there's no wires or any or float sensors within those bottles. This is just the data that is on those chips. Um, also, you do will never really want to do any kind of auto nozzle checks or cleans. Uh, you will get paper out errors, so please don't ever pl click that. If you want to do head cleanings from here, uh, you're welcome to, or print nozzle checks. Um, but you can also do it a lot easier just from the control panel on the actual physical printer itself. Next under there, you have print test page. What print test page does is it gives you some of the different um, swatches and little test pages that you can uh, print out. You can do a CMYK swatch pages, RGB, and lab color. So that way, if I kind of zoom in here, I can show you some of the different uh, things that you can print out, just as little testers and things like that. Um, you can sit there and create uh, your own color swatches so that way you can actually pick different colors uh, if you have a customer that is uh, picky about uh, color matching and things like that. 
If you need more of an explanation of how to do this, uh, definitely call into our support line. Um, they are multiple pages, so you would have to print these to uh, a white garment. It's not good for doing to darks, um, but uh, we can help you walk through that if you need to. All right, let me cancel that real quick. Next thing down here is quick print test page. Once I go to quick uh, the test page, I can use whichever one it is and set as my current quick test page, and it will print that out. This kind of gives me a um, uh, this would be something that you could do for printing to uh, um, to like a, a dark garment or a light garment, just to make sure if you don't have anything to print for that day, because uh, the printer is made to be used. Uh, it's got about about four to five day buffer that you can let it sit without printing anything, it, as long as you've shut it down accordingly to the shutdown maintenance video as well. All right. Next one over is your tools. You can go into options. Uh, once we go into options, uh, it'll give you some general stuff like showing the splash screen at the beginning. Uh, always on top, make sure that this program stays on top of everything else. I never really use that. Um, allow selection of Windows ports. I don't really mess with that. And, uh, and Some Uber users of the software might want to use that later on, but uh, if you need uh, clarification, call in to support as well. Uh, thin character support should always be uh, clicked. Automatically track items. I just leave that at the default. I don't really show advanced settings or options uh, unless I really need to. Uh, a technician will walk you through any of those advanced settings uh, if you need any kind of corrections. I'm a big fan. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, show select a page dialog on the import multiple jobs. What this does is bring up uh, settings so that way you set, set your settings before each job. If you have your queues set up properly, you don't need to go through this every single time. You can change the units of measurement uh, and you can also change the amount of decimal places. Um, you can go into some of the hidden dialogs if you want to, but we recommend that we don't usually use those. All right, storage and archiving basically shows you what the available space of your uh, hard drives and what's available. Like this right here is a uh, USB key. This is my data uh, drive and then my regular uh, hard drive. Um, and then it'll also, uh, you can default where those uh, jobs are archived when you archive something. And I'll actually show you how to archive it. It's pretty simple. Once you have something processed and printed and you like it the way it is, you can either right, cl right click on it and click on archive job and it will default to this folder right here. Or you can change that folder name by clicking over here on these three little dots and choosing a folder to go to. Or you can click this little file cabinet which is also archive job. All right, under ripping, uh, you can set the memory allocation of where how much memory it uses. Um, usually just the default works well, uh, so that way if you're doing multiple things, like while something is printing or ripping, that you can still use your computer to do other things. Um, and then the cache size of how long it, uh, it saves. All right. Um, use alternate rip is basically if you had multiple rips installed on the same computer, which I do not recommend, uh, but it is possible to do that. Under processing, uh, this is how many maximum number of concurrent jobs can process at one time. Me personally, I like to bump it up to three uh, just because I have a little bit faster of a computer. Uh, so that way, if I have multiple jobs or something like that and I'm in a rush, I can sit there and do multiple images at the same time and have them rip or pre rip before I print. All right. Next one down is your preview options. The previews are going to get better as the software develops, um, but what, the way I like it said, if I have a pretty good graphics card and a pretty good processor in my computer and enough RAM, I like to turn it up to very high, and I'll do an 8-bit per pixel using a bitmap driver, so that way my previews come out a little bit cleaner looking. Now, just in respect, the uh, previews will not come out um, really crisp or kind of give you the same definition that they do in, say, Photoshop or your graphics software, because it is just a simple bitmap driver. The good thing about the preview, it shows you things that, uh, say, I forgot to de uh, delete a hidden layer in Photoshop, and it gives me a big white background on my b black background or black shirt uh, cue and it will show me a big white box that way I can tell oh I need to go correct something before I print this out because it shows you the way it's going to print all right also the number of previews it can create at the same time I'll bump that up to three same stipulation the better your computer is the the better it will come out your gamma adjustment right here is the way the preview looks 
the lower the number, the darker the image is going to appear in the preview. The higher the number, the the more pasty and washed out. Usually I go of like a 0.85 for mine. Uh, but that's at your discretion. Uh, what you would do to see which way you want it is to import a graphic and then uh, see what the preview comes out. Try to get it as close to the, what the image looks like uh, within your graphic software and um, then you can click and then you can make an adjustment right click on the job and say generate preview again and then it'll take those adjustments after you change them again alright so I'll click on save and close so the only things that are really changed within this option drop down menu under tools was my processing I bumped that up to three and also my preview options very high the gamma adjustment at 0.85 8 bits uh, per pixel using a bitmap driver with soft proofing and then also bumping up the number of previews that I can generate at the same time. Okay. Next is direct to port. Um, what this is is a diagnostic tool for your technician. Say you're having issues with your printer that it's rendering out a graphic uh, not to the standards that you're looking for. Um, and as a technician we have to determine whether it's the machine that is having an issue or the graphic software or the uh, RIP software that's having the issue. So what we can do to determine this is we can pre-RIP and print something back at our office and then we can create a uh, PRN or a print file and we can email this to you and that way you can basically click on here and drop drag and drop that file right into this little box and it will immediately start printing I would actually click over here choose the port and it what it does is bypass your rip setting and use the settings that the technician has uh, and then we can determine oh is your printer the one that's messing up or is it the software okay Next, under View, is just some basic stuff like View pr uh, Visual Print Manager. That's this whole area right here. Or Always on Top and some other stuff. The View Raw Data, we'll come to that a little bit later once we actually process the job. Okay. Next is we can go to our Help menu. Under the Help menu, uh, we can go through Help Topics, which is basically you can type in a topic, and uh, and it also has all the different uh, manual and things to that order. So feel free to look at that at your convenience. The next one down is the Update License File. Um, if you're ever having issues with your RIP software, uh, one of the technicians, or if you say update your device, or update the program itself, then you will always want to come in here and update your license file. Real simple to do. Click on it. It'll say the new license file is activated. Current license file is backed up. So what we'll do is click OK, and then it'll ask you to restart your RIP software. So we'll just close it out and then reopen it. Okay, so those were your drop down menus. All right, going across the top here, those are some of those other buttons that I was telling you about under the jobs menu. Um, if you hover your mouse over things, it will actually give you a little fly out, or maybe it won't. <laughs> um, but what it does, the first one here is add job. Okay, um, if I click on add a job, it also brings up the open uh, dialog box, and that way I can go look, say, on my computer under my data drive to see some of my different artworks where I've got them saved at. The next one, if I did have a job imported, or let's actually just go ahead and import a job now so that way it activates some of these features. All right, so I will come in here. I want to click on data because that's where I've got most of my stuff stored. I'll just bring up a design real quick. Let's see, let's go with baby girl. I love this image. What it will do is import this job and drop it in the first available slot. Depending on how fast your computer is and how big the graphic is, is how long this takes. As you can see, it says importing job one of one. When this comes up, uh, you have two choices, express or select. All right, Select would be, um, I could choose which slot or which platen it goes to, say the bottom one or the top one, depending on whatever you're doing. 
Express just puts it in the very first available template. This is the one that I typically use for everything. And if you don't want to have to click on this every time you import a job, you can also click on Don't Show This Dialog box on Next Import. All right, or you can cancel out. So I'm going to click on Express here, and it's going to drop it in this first available slot. When I say first available slot, I can minus this out, and that way you can see that this would be the first slot, and this would be the second slot of my two-up configuration. And if I keep minusing out, you'll notice that I can keep queuing up things, uh, so that way if I had an operator, I could have things queued up and ready for them uh, for the entire day. Okay, so here's the image that I brought in. Okay, this is from a really cool movie that uh, Quentin Tarantino did, just so you know. <laughs> okay, so from here, going across, that was open a job. If I wanted to do a second or different shirt, um, I could say minus this out a little bit, click on open again, and it would bring up a second job and drop it in the next available slot. If I wanted it to go to the next uh, platen down or the next job down, I would have to go ahead and process this one first, and then it would drop it into the next slot one over here. If I don't process it, it's going to put it in two, and it will uh, then group those two together once I click on print. Okay. Next one over is remove job. That would basically, if I click on here, then I have the ability to remove it. All right. Um, release job is if it was held. Uh, hold job is basically I could hold it or pause it. Next one over is spool job. What spooling does, or ripping is another term for it, um, it will basically process the job without printing it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go on, and then we have our print job. Uh, what this would do is I have to make sure before I hit print that my machine is ready to go. Um, I have to have the shirt on the to the platen, uh, tucked and leveled. I will push in the first leading edge of my platen onto the cover, so that way the load laser uh, sees it. And, um, and then load the machine, so that way it gets to the ready point. Then I can highlight the job and click print, and once it finishes processing, it will immediately start printing. All right. If the job, if your shirt is not ready and loaded, what you can do is actually right-click on it and rip only or spool job. Um, like if I right-click, you see some of the different features here. This is the same thing. Rip only is the same thing as spool job up here. Uh, and then you also have remove, rename if I want to. Um, find the job on the page. There's just different little properties and things that you can go through. Okay. Next one over is print and cut and then cut job. These were This RIP software is an OEM RIP uh, and is used by a couple different manufacturers and a different types of machines, so that's why these two buttons in here. This will have nothing to do with the DTG process, just for your information. The next thing is archive job. So after I say spool it or rip it, and I like the way it outputs and print it, what I can do is right click on it and archive the job and then it goes into the archive. The next ones are your kind of placement and uh, stretching of the job. One thing I will have to do is click on the job before these buttons will be active. Say I want to kind of max it out to the page, it will uh, max it out to the page until it hits one of the sides of the templates, sort of like this. And then I can also hit recenter, and then it will recenter it in there. It can be very valuable if you're just trying to do a nice large print. Okay. Next buttons that are grayed out, uh, abort job, that's if I'm in the middle of printing something and I don't want to uh, print it anymore, or say I accidentally kick the USB cable out of my computer and it stops printing, uh, then I can abort the job and basically get it out of my rip and out of processing, and then I can remove it or re-rip it or something to that order. This one right here with the wipe error, I would get an error, say if I disconnected my USB, I can clear the error, and then it will be ready to, at the ready print, uh, ready to print stage, uh, like as if I was just loading up the shirt. But it will save the spooled file after it's been spooled. Next one over here is start queue. Um, that's if I have a whole bunch of stuff pre-ripped and things like that, or brought into there, I can go ahead and start the queue ripping as it goes. 
I can also stop the queue if it's in the middle of that. I don't really use this 90% of the time, so or even probably 98% of the time. I usually just print a job and then move on to the next one. Next one over here is configure queue. Depending on which queue you're clicked on, it can go into the queue properties. You can also get to this by double clicking on the queue and it brings up its queue properties here. And we'll come back to this to kind of explain these as well. All right, and then the next one, printer status, that's the same thing that was in the uh, checking the nozzle checks and the ink levels and things like that. Okay, so moving down, we have our different queue tabs. The queue tabs here are uh, predefined settings determining uh, what you're printing on. Um, I can use the black quality queue for any color shirt, but with the but what it's going to do is have the settings for the black quality. Um, it the printer itself does not have an eyeball on it. It does not see what you're printing. You're basically using these cues to use predefined settings. We just kind of made it a little bit easier for you, so that way you don't have to remember to change all these different things when you're trying to print to certain colors of shirts or whether you want to print with white ink or without white ink. Uh, the cues that print with white ink are your black quality, black speed, color quality, and color speed. Uh, they would print an underbase automatically and then print color uh, ink on top of it. The white cues are basically for non-white ink printing. It would do a single layer of color on top of them. Okay, so let's go through and start optimizing these cues and kind of, and I'll give you my uh, kind of preferred settings that gives me really good output. So I'll start over here with my black quality. Okay. In here, these are my general settings. This is the name of it. I can rename it if you don't like the name here. I can take off Viper if you want, so that way you can see it a little bit better. Um, and then I can change my print mode. For my quality queue, I prefer going up to a higher quality um, setting. And I'm going to use one of these black shirt print modes. All right. These right here are all your color modes. Okay. Uh, this is for regardless if I print to a uh, a white shirt without white ink underneath it or a dark shirt. The, this is the color layer. Okay, so for my quality, I'm going to choose black shirt 1440 by 720. Now you may also see these letters behind these print modes. What these stand for, HS stands for high speed or bi-directional printing, meaning that when the print head slides left to right, it's laying ink down in both directions. Okay, uh, There does have to be a specific distance between the shirt and the bottom of the print head, so that way it doesn't have double lines. Okay, Without the HS on it, uh, is unidirectional mode. Unidirectional mode lays ink down going in from the um, from the capping station over to the emergency stop of the machine and then resetting itself back and then laying ink down. A lot more accurate but also takes twice as long. Uh, another benefit of the unidirectional print mode is printing stuff that has weird shapes uh, say like up around a collar or things like that so that way you the gap lasers uh, will lower the shirt down so that way it would give this kind of bi-directional blur if it's too far away from the print head so by switching to unidirectional it can be further away from the print head and it will uh, give you a crisper print but it does take a little bit longer to print Okay, the next one is RW. It uh, stands for rewind. That means that the print will come uh, once the job is completed, whether it have an underbase or not. Uh, once it is completely finished, it will rewind towards the front of the machine or the front roller. Uh, if the RW is not there, it will eject it to the back of the machine. Okay, so me personally, I have my machine backed up to a wall, so I'm going to choose to uh, rewind it when it's finished. So for my quality queue, I'm going to go black shirt 1440 by 720, uh, bidirectional or high speed printing with a rewind towards the front of the machine. Okay, your substrate color really has no bearing on what you're actually printing. If I put a green shirt in there, It'll print it just like if it was black here, okay? Uh, it's just basically the background of your preview over here. So that way it gives you kind of what it's going to look like as if I had a black shirt up there or a colored shirt up there or so forth. Okay. 
Next one down is hot folders. Uh, hot folders are created for like multiple users and stuff. If you need a, a no, for typical printer use with only one printer, you usually do not use hot folders. There is a description of it in your help menu, and if you need a further description of it, you are welcome to call into the support line. Under media setup, uh, this should not really ever change. It should always be set for template media, so that way you have the choices between one up, two up, and four up. And then you have margins as well. These usually always stay at zero. All right. Next one down is your layout manager. There is some useful stuff in here, uh, but it does need some clarification. Uh, layout on the jobs as it arrives. That basically means as it comes in, it's going to put it on the next available slot. Uh, mirroring your job on import. There's not too many times that you would want to do this, except you're, if you were printing to like uh, the invert of a. Um, like a piece of plexiglass or something to that order. But that definitely requires uh, different types of pretreatments and kind of special skills to do that. And then you can also invert the job as well. But we 99% of the time you'll never have those checked. All right, processing multiple pages as an overlay. That be, means basically you could bring multiple pages as a time. Uh, pausing between copies, uh, it does do that. Uh, laying out the jobs from left to right, it's if, uh, that would be instead of it going up to down, it would go left to right uh, over here on the preview screen. Remember when I actually zoomed out unit using my negative mi mi magnifying glass here and it had the multiple platens listed down below, this would go left to right instead of top to bottom. All right, showing the import template uh, is basically where I uh, unchecked the um, uh, the express and select when I first imported it. You can always turn that back on if you want. Automatically close the template when all the slots are full. I hardly ever use that. These two are very useful, especially if I'm doing a lot of like one-off type of shirts. Um, say I want to print just in this front platen and then go on to another piece of artwork or something like that. Instead of the entire platen having to advance all the way to the back of the machine and then rewind, what this will do is remove the space from the document and it will actually, after it finishes printing, it will advance up about two inches and then rewind instead of pushing the entire platen through the machine. It'll actually speed up your production. Okay, if you're doing one shirt at a time. All right, the next one, um, but one thing you do have to remember before I move on is that if you have it set to uh, eject towards the back of the machine or the RW removed from the print mode, these two check marks need to be removed or you'll have a big offset and misregistration of your print. Okay. Um, once I uh, rip something, this is basically once I bring it in, it will actually hold it there until I tell it to do something. All right, because I want to make sure that uh, I can size it and things like that. But if you already pre-size your stuff uh, accordingly to the size of your templates, you can rip it now and then print it later. And if you're really quick and make sure that you have your shirt loaded and everything like that before you import your job, it can rip it and print it as soon as you import the job into the template here. But most of the time, I like to hold it so that way I can size it. I can determine if I want it, say, two inches down. I can hit two down here on my sizing, and then it will be there. And then I can rip it, and then I can print it. Okay. Under printer status, um, you can sit there and set up uh, automatic head cleanings. Say you go out of town for like a week or something like that. You can set this to run every, like every 12 hours, but you need to make sure that that waste ink bottle is not close to full. It will overflow on you. It will not stop. So if you're going out of town for a week, you might want to extend your tubes using some like aquarium tubing down to like a five gallon bucket if you ever use this. But it's a way to set it up automatically. All right. But if you did it every two hours, you're going to be using a lot of ink. Uh, so be careful uh, with doing that. Okay, next one down is your job reserve. This is something that you should check on all your queues no matter what. Uh, what this does is after you rip it that first time and then it'll drop it down here into the reserve, it will save the spooled file. So that way if I want to do a second one, I can right click on it and hit print and that way I do not have to re-rip it every time. Also will speed up your production. So remember to check this mark every on all your queues. All right.
The next one, crop marks. I never really use this. This is also part of that uh, print and cut feature, which is not really available for the DTG Viper. Okay. Uh, next, we have another subcategory, which is our import options. Under import options, we have our underbase application details. This is how the white ink is affected. These are my white ink settings. Okay. In here, there's a couple things uh, that we'll explain more in detail. Uh, your printing order should always be white, then color. You can do color only, which will be for uh, the Viper white quality and the white speed. Uh, white, then color is the normal printing. White with color would be your one pass fast. It's not completed in development yet, but it is something that you can play around with. Color than white would basically be like the inversion. Uh, say I was going to print to the underside of a piece of plexiglass, so that way I could see the color first and then the white first. It does take a, a little bit higher of a uh, skill level to be able to do this properly and make it look professional. Okay. The next one down is knock me blackout. Okay. So with this, you notice uh, that this is only going to be turned on in my black quality and black speed queue. What this means, it's going to use the black of the shirt to be the black of the design. All right. So from here, um, it basically acts like a uh, a brightness slider for your underbase. Okay. What it's going to what it is actually going to underbase. All right, a uh, way to kind of tell what this does, I'm going to import the job a couple times. So this was the default at 64. I'm going to take this down to say 13, click OK, and what I'll do is import the image. Again, anytime I make changes within the queue, I have to import the job again a second time. It does not make adjustments to the one that is already in the queue because it does a, a little bit of pre-processing as it is imported. So let's see, let's click on the baby girl again. It'll import it into this next slot here. I'll slide this down a little bit. And you notice the white ink underbase does not give the color enough to pop on. All right, so let's go to the opposite end of that spectrum. Let's delete this one out of here. I'll click on Remove. I'll go back into my queue properties and go to the underbase uh, or the import options, underbase application details, and I'm going to slide this up to say 150. Once I click OK there, I'll re-import the job. There's baby girl again and you will see the difference between the three. See how it brings a lot more of the image out? But in retrospect, it'll also kind of add too much white underneath it, making it look uh, all pasty and stuff and kind of not blend the colors in correctly. All right, so the kind of sweet spot you might be asking yourself is between that 60 and kind of 80 mark, all right? And it does take a little getting used to, uh, depending on your images. Um, so I would definitely recommend uh, kind of playing around with it so that way you can get a better feel for it. Import an image, print it one way. Import it, uh, and change your settings, import it again, print it again, and kind of find your sweet spot that works best for your type of graphics. So I'm going to go to about like 64, which was the default. I'll click OK here. All right, the next one down is Color Boost. All right, Color Boost, what it is, is kind of a saturation slider for your color. All right, say I have a, a white edge peeking out around the edge of my graphic. It's kind of, uh, kind of like skim milk around the outside edges of it. What this does is the color dots are, let me explain it a little bit clearer than that. Um, 
On the edge of a graphic, say it's faded, like a feathered edge. Those pixels on the edge are very uh, non-opaque. You can see through them. They'd be like in that 1 to 10% opacity, uh, which uh, of like a, a light cyan or a light yellow or something like that. And then we're going to be putting a large dot of white ink underneath it. So you would still be able to see through the color to the white, which makes it look like a big white edge around it. So what the uh, color boost does is actually extend or make the dot, the color dot, a little bit bigger to compensate for that. But also keep in mind that if you have it too high, it will affect the colors of the inside of the graphic as well, making it look oversaturated uh, and kind of muddy looking. So I usually leave these at the default unless I need to play with them. Uh, like when I'm first getting used to this software and first testing it out and kind of seeing how it affects my graphics, I'll print, I'll shrink the graphic up and print it in like four different areas on the same shirt, playing around with these settings and then, um, and then importing it again and then uh, printing it out to see which best, which best gives me the results. Okay. Next is your select underbase print mode. All right, you have three choices, a heavy underbase, a medium underbase, or a very light underbase. For our quality cue, I like to set it at the quality underbase. Okay. Then you have your underbase strength. This is kind of how the RIP software determines what to underbase for and what it considers a dark color. All right. If I had this set for strong, it would print an underbase underneath everything. Okay. If I have it set for 19, it would underbase everything except for the color dark black. All right. And then so forth, say like navy, forest green, and then going down, weak would basically not underbase hardly anything. I know the default comes in at 14, but it will kind of not underbase properly, so I like to bump mine up to about 19. And then if I need to, if I don't like the way it's printing, then bump it down after the fact. All right. Um, over here we have our opacity, gamma, and highlights. Opacity is basically what it's going to, uh, the thickness of your white. Say you're getting a lot of puddling under your white, but you are pre-treating properly. Say it's just outputting too much white onto your shirt. You can actually uh, tone this back by a percentage, so that way it prints, say, 95% of what it's capable of. Most of the time, if you have your shirt pre-treated properly, 100% um, works fine. Uh, like I said before, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. All right, this is the the white underneath the um, like your midtones. Uh, usually, that will always stay the same. I can count on one hand how many times I've ever changed that. And the same thing with the highlights. The highlights are the visibly white areas, sort of like my uh, the word coldesi here, or like the white in somebody's eye or something like that. I definitely want to print that at 100% because I want that to be or at its maximum so that way it's, it covers up those visibly white areas so I don't see the shirt underneath it. Okay. Under your choke, uh, the underbase or stop the white from peeking out. What this does is say I have a one inch red square. Okay. If I have a red square and I have white peeking out on all edges, okay, uh, if the white is peeking out on all edges, what this does is shave off pixels so that way the color overlaps it a little bit, giving it a clean edge. The default is around 5. Uh, sometimes I'll drum back down to medium uh, so that way um, <clears throat> it will, uh, it, it a little bit more underbase will be underneath those. One thing you do have to know is that if you go past 7, say you have tiny lettering, like something around 12 points or even below, like really tiny, like say Bible verse lettering, what this will do is basically choke them out. It will not be able to print an underbase underneath them, uh, and you won't be able to see them on the darker garments. So please don't go over 7 when it comes to your underbase choke. <clears throat> Highlights. What they do is turn on white ink during the color pass, not just during the underbase pass. White technically is not a color, okay? White is absence of color on a CMYK scale, 0% CMYNK, which equals white. Um, so white is does not mix with any other color to make another color. It just lightens it. 
So, but something that you could use this for is say for your speed cues that have less uh, ink in them, then they will um, or have less of an underbase underneath them. And then for those visibly white areas, sort of like white lettering or the white in somebody's eye, the little twinkle in somebody's uh, ring or something like that, it'll dust it with a little extra white ink to make it pop a little bit more. Another one that you have to kind of play around with uh, to kind of get, get a feel of where you want it. Most of the time on my quality uh, cues, I do not need to uh, use any highlights whatsoever, especially if the pre -treat is, uh, the shirt is pre-treated properly. Next we have our underbase and color pass repeats. Okay, I can make my underbase print more than once. I definitely do not want to use a quality underbase 1440 twice. If I need to use it twice, there means there's something else going on with the printer. Uh, either you're not getting a good nozzle check, um, your WIMS filter needs to be replaced, the little white uh, disc that's over near your white ink reservoir, or um, the shirt is not pre-treated properly. If the shirt does not have enough pre-treatment on it, what happens is the uh, the water base that the white ink or the titanium dioxide is suspended in, the water base wicks into the cotton fibers because it's an absorbent uh, material, and then it just leaves little white speckles all over the shirt. All right, uh, you can see an example of this in some of our training videos as well. Um, and no matter how many layers of white you put onto it, the only thing it'll do is just soak into the back of the shirt. The pretreatment is one of the most important processes uh, to get a, a good white layer uh, um, adhered to your shirt before putting the color on top of it. Uh, but using multiple color passes can be used or be useful into kind of hitting it just a little bit extra so that way it will uh, be a little bit more vibrant or something to that order. And it's not really making it more vibrant, it's just putting an extra layer of ink on top of it. So for darker colors, they would make them darker. For lighter colors, it would also make them a little bit darker because it's mixing those two layers together. All right, but it is very useful if you're doing, say, uh, foil printing. All right, uh, for foil printing, definitely go to our uh, Coleman and Company website and uh, check out some other foil products that we have. And then, if you need a, a much more detailed description on how to do that, uh, call into your support line. Okay, so these are our underbase settings. The basic things that I changed for optimizing were changing my underbase strength to 19. Um, and also uh, I ch changed my choke uh, settings to about medium out of and because usually they default at around like five. okay? All right. Next one down is finish application details. You notice these are grayed out. This is not something that we use for the DTG process. All right. Next, we have our uh, finish or I'm sorry, the print mode overrides, ICC profiles and half tones. The ICC profiles are defaulted. Our programmer basically went through with a color spectrometer, uh, printed out his uh, s color swatches there, and then scanned them with a spectrometer so that way we could do proper color man uh, management and uh, render the, the colors that you see on your computer screen uh, can be rendered onto the actual shirt itself. All right. Um, most of these do not need to be changed, uh, but you do have the ability of going in and changing them and kind of doing some test prints to kind of figure out where they're at. Okay. Under half tones, these are also grayed out. Um, I usually do not mess with these whatsoever. Uh, it's uh, if you need an advanced type thing, is this is something that you might want to get into uh, is changing these different things. Uh, call into the support line and we can probably get you in touch with the actual programmer himself to kind of see uh, what settings that you were trying to achieve and he can happily walk through that. Okay, next I'll just collapse these two little menus here and go to other. Under other, we can start a log and also go into the history of this design. Uh, like if I click on history, I can enable job history. What it'll do is create a basic uh, temporary folder into um, uh, of like and record like different settings that you do and stuff like that. I hardly ever use that, um, but you're welcome to at any time. 
under the log it can show you the kind of the uh, processing the programmer himself uses this if you're having issues uh, with something that's going on the rip so you can see if it processed or loaded properly uh, initialized the instance completely successful those type things we won't really use those on a day-to-day -day basis whatsoever but under costing we will under costing, you have all these fields that you can uh, set up uh, for setting up ink cost, material, surface treatment cost, things like that. Me personally, is I put in the cost of a liter of ink uh, because that's the size ink bottles that I buy, and um, uh, and then that way when I do a print job, I can always check the cost of it uh, either before I print it or after it is printed. Um, if you were getting the nine ounce bottles uh, instead of the uh, quart bottles or anything like that, you will need to do the conversion to bring it up to the liter price, all right? And then e enter that price into there. So from here, uh, the basic uh, pricing for a liter of ink through our Coleman and Company website for the DTG brand quality inks, it's around the average of 284. I kind of rounded up. I'll hit enter once, go down to the next field. Black ink and colored ink are basically the same prices. All right. Um, and I usually only do single passes of it, uh, so that way uh, that's what one, uh, one print job would cost me. Then my white ink cost here is $2.99 for a liter. Okay, same thing with the passes. Um, clear ink passes, that's for one of the other printers that is not available in the United States. Um, it does a different processing and stuff like that, so that's not something we have to worry about. The ink contingency is basically like a fudge factor. You can uh, There's not really a set number that we've come up with that you should set this at. Uh, it's something that you can determine later depending on your, like, uh, your operation and things like that. You can put in labor cost uh, per unit or something to that order. But remember that if these numbers are variable, uh, job per job, you will have to come in here and set this before you process and before you print every single time. So, in my opinion, that's why I go through and set these ink prices before um, before I actually, just the ink prices uh, and not anything else in here. Uh, so that way I know what the, the ink cost is, uh, not versus like, because my material could be different, my surface treatment, I could do a heavy pretreatment versus a lighter pretreatment, all those things, those are all variables but you're welcome to fill out all these different fields for your information. Okay, so once we click OK, that locks in those Q settings. Okay, so now that you kind of understand the settings that are in the different queues, I'm going to go through and kind of optimize these other queues a little bit quicker. So I'll double click on my black speed. I'm going to change this print mode to the black shirt 720 HSRW and just as a reminder uh, 1440 is basically how many uh, the the amount that the swipes of the print head overlap each other. 720 basically overlaps halfway, and then the 1440 by 720 is basically like two thirds of the way, uh, and then it, as it advances down. All right. So for my speed uh, queue, I want to use the lower print mode, but still use the bidirectional printing and the rewind uh, to the front of the machine. I will scroll down here to my layout manager. I'm going to click on remove white space from bottom and, t and right. Uh, and then also as a reminder again, you do not, you should not have these checked if you're printing to, uh, um, if you are rewinding or ejecting to the back of the machine once the job is done. Then I'll click on job reserve, save spooled file. That way I don't have to reprocess or re-rip it every single time that I want to print it again. All right. I'll come down here to import options, go to underbase application details. Knock me blackout is still turned on. I will bump my under uh, my underbase strength up to 19 again. And then I will change my choke underbase to about 3 medium. All right. And then I can leave these highlights turned on so that way for this underbase that's a little bit lighter, it will hit those visibly white areas uh, with just a little bit of extra ink. Okay. And then I'll also go into my costing as well. 284 for the black and 284 for the color, 299 for the white. And then hit enter. Okay, now we'll go to the Viper color quality. 
Now, like I said, the substrate color has nothing to do with the output of the colors onto your whatever color you have on the shirt. This is just the background color that the uh, programmer chain uh, chose, so that way when you import a file on top of it, you can see the image on top of it. So what I'll do, I personally do not like turquoise, um, so what I'll do is change it to about 150. Whoops. on all fields right here. Whoops. Let me backspace off of these. Go one five zero, enter twice, one five zero, enter twice. And I like a nice little gray background. So the reason I chose gray is that if I have white in my image for this color shirt uh, that is visible, that I would be able to see it on top of it. You're welcome to change it to whatever color you want. And like I, and I'll repeat again, it makes no bearing. If I had this set to gray and I'm printing to a red shirt, it would print the exact same if I had this set to red uh, or gray. So it's up to you. It's your preference. Okay. Then from there, I'm going to go down to Layout Manager, remove my white spaces, go down to Job Reserve, save this pulled file. Import options are a little bit different than the black shirt options here. The import options here uh, do not have Knock Me Blackout on. So the stipulation with this is your graphics have to have a transparency background. If you print a JPEG, it has a background, whether it be white, black, or something else, and it is a completely flattened image. It will print what you see on the screen. Okay. And you notice the color burst is a color boost is a little bit lower on here. You can drum this up higher uh, when you're printing to your uh, colored shirts to kind of compensate for like little white edges and things like that where it looks like skim milk around the edge. I will also change my underbase to the uh oh, we're in the quality here, so I'm gonna leave that at the quality setting. Change my uh underbase print uh strength to nineteen again. 3 is the default for the underbase uh, peeking out, uh, the choke setting, and no highlight there. So, and I will then go down to Other, click on Costing, I'll set those numbers as well, 284, Enter, 284, Enter, 299, Enter. And then, just because I didn't check it before, I'm going to go back to General and make sure that I have this set for my quality setting as well. So instead of using my black shirt uh, color or cues here or print modes, I'm going to use the regular ones. So 1440 by 720 HSRW would be for my color setting. Okay, so then I can click OK out of here. Now I'll move on to the speed. I want to change my substrate color to that 150 on all three of those. I hit from here, I hit enter twice. One, two, three. One, two. Three, two. Okay, and then I'm going to change my print mode to the 720 by 720 HSRW. Go to Layout Manager, and since I have the platen ejecting to the front of the machine, I'm going to remove uh, the white space from the bottom and top. Under Job Reserve, I'm going to click on Save Spooled File. Import Options, Under Base Application Details, Not Me Blackout is not turned on. My underbase strength will go up to 19. It has the medium underbase there. All right, and then I will leave these at the defaults: three for the choke and nine for the highlights. Go down to other costing, and same as before. And then click OK. All right, so that was setting my white ink printing cues, the black quality, black speed, color quality, and color speed. Now we'll move over to the non-white ink printing cues, which are my white uh, quality and white speed. So let's double click on the white quality. You notice the substrate color is white. And I will change my print mode also to the 1440 by 720 for the quality. I'm gonna go to the layout manager, remove the white space. Go to Job Reserve, save the spooled file, import options, just to show you, you notice that these are not turned on. It's set to color only. But I can do multiple passes if I want to. This is where you would set up, say if I want to hit it with a second layer of color, just to kind of make the image a little bit more saturated and a little bit more vibrant. Two passes will always look better than one. 
Okay, next we'll go back down to other, set the costing here. 84. I'm not really printing with white ink, so that's why I can put it here. All right, one of the other things that you can do uh, that's kind of like an advanced type thing is coming back here to the underbase application details. You notice that I can still change this highlight white. All right. What, and remember I said before, what this does is turn on white ink during the color uh, pass or the color mode. All right, so an example of when this might be used is say I could do a Kelly green shirt and it has black lettering and white lettering on there. The white lettering is not being covered up by anything. It doesn't have any color on top of it. So what I could do is turn this uh, highlight all the way up to strong so it prints a lot of white ink during the color pass and that way it would give it would print the white lettering and the black lettering at the exact same time. It's a cool little feature that it will speed up instead of doing a multi-pass print on, say, the color uh, cues over here. Okay, so I'll click OK out of this. Next is the white speed. I'm going to change it to my R HSRW. That'll stay the same. Layout Manager. Job Reserve. Import Options, just to check. And the reason highlights aren't turned on in this speed queue is normally when you're printing to white garments or very light, like natural color or something like that, um, I can uh, I do not want to print white ink to it. One of the stipulations when you're using white ink, it does not matter what color shirt it is going on, white, blue, black, whatever, the shirt has to be pre-treated for the white ink to sit on top of the fabric. That is cardinal rule number one. Anytime you want to use white ink on any shirt, the shirt has to be pre-treated. Okay, then we'll go down here to costing. And then click OK. Okay, so those were all my default cues I have set up here. So now what I'm going to do is create a brand new queue for myself. All right, so I'm going to go to queue, manage queues. And what I'm going to do is create a queue that is going to print with white ink only. Okay, uh, it could be useful for doing, say, we'll use the example, a Got Milk shirt, the, a black shirt with just white lettering on it. Um, the reason I would create a queue like this is so that way I don't have to do two passes. All right. So what this does is kind of trick the printer into using the half of the print head that has white ink in it as if it was color. So what I'm going to do is do, and I would want a thick white layer on there. So what I'm going to do is take this Viper white quality queue and I'm going to make a copy of it. All right. What it'll do is drop down a, a copy down here at the bottom. And if I want to get into those properties, I can click this little button that has the little three dots on it to go into its queue properties. So what I'll do here is highlight this and type in white ink only. All right. Then from there, I'm going to choose the print mode that is going to use the white ink only. I will use the heaviest setting, which is 1440 by 1440, HS, which is bidirectional, and RW, which is rewind to the front of the machine. All right. But since this is going to print with white ink, I wouldn't be able to see the graphic on here, on the, my preview. So I'm going to have to change this to black. So that way I can kind of visually see it. Okay. What the way to kind of trick this uh, printer into printing with just white ink is you have to think it like a printer does. Okay, a printer thinks in percentages of liquid, not by an actual color. Like I said before, there is no eyeballs on this printer to say, oh, you're printing purple or something to that order. All right, it just thinks in data. So when it comes to color, uh, say in Photoshop, 
uh, the darker the color is, the more ink that is printed out. Say for black, it's a mixture of all of the different colors. For white, it's absence of color. There is no percentages values in there. So when I create my Got Milk uh, in my graphics software, I will create it in the color black because it has a higher percentage of data to it, higher percentage of saturation. And then when I import it into this queue, it will render it in white for the simple fact that it's saying that, hey, you're sending over high values of saturation, but instead of printing it with the color half of the print head where the color ink's going to, it's going to print it with the half of the head that only has white into it. Um, to verify that you're doing this properly, if you set this up like this, uh, the Viper white ink only queue, and choose the print mode that says white ink only 1440 by uh, 1440 HSRW, and change your substrate color to black, and then type something in your graphic software that is in the color black. When you import it into this queue, it will look white over here in the preview screen. If it do, if you don't see anything, that means you did it wrong. Okay? So if you have trouble understanding this, please call into the support line and we can explain it a little bit clearer. All right. So since I made a copy of the queue that I had already changed, you'll notice this. It already has those check marks of the job reserves, the import options, and everything like that. And my costing is already set up as well. But I will want to change this costing, all right? Because since I'm only using um, white ink, I'm just going to change all of these to 299 because that's how much my white ink cost. Okay, and then click OK. Okay, so there's my new queue right here. Okay. Another queue that I can set up is, say, for a non-textile. But instead of copying one of these queues, I'm going to create one from scratch. So I'm just going to click on Add Queue. So then I can come in here. I want to do the printer. All right. Uh, the port, I will select the Epson. All right. And then I can choose a print mode. These are all the available print modes right here. So with this one, I'm going to choose, say, Let's go, let's go with something different for a little bit. We'll just choose default for right now. I'm going to show you how to create a custom print mode as well so it can go higher than the 1440 by 720. So I'm just going to choose default for right now. So I'm going to click on next. Then I'm going to name it. I'm going to go delete the DTG here. And I'll scroll to the end. And I'm going to write in non, oops, non hyphen textile non textiles would be anything that is not like a fabric uh, such as like a stretched canvas a piece of wood um, a piece of unfinished tile or something to that order now one of the stipulations with doing this is there you're not going to be using your heat press or your typical printing uh, fashions uh, what you would have to do is order some non textile pretreatment and also the non textile post treatment from Coleman and Company uh, your supply shop where you get all your inks from so I'll click on next here. I'm going to go into template media again. Okay. Uh, the default template, I'll just choose two up for this one. And then click on next. And it says there's no layout options for template media, which is normal. Click on next. I definitely want to hold the job. Click on finish. And now I'll have a non textile. Okay. I'm going to come back to this queue in just a little bit so I can show you some of the higher functions of the um, of the under devices and manage uh, print modes. So I'm going to close this for right now. Okay, so what I was just talking about is we're going to go in here to devices and manage print modes. Under manage print modes, we have all these different print modes here. Okay, uh, everything that you saw before. So what I'm going to do is choose a print mode here that is basically, I'm going to do the 1440 by 720 RW because when I'm doing non-textiles, I want really crisp and really accurate printing. So I want to do it in unidirectional print mode. All right, so what I'm going to do is highlight this one right here uh, that has the RW because I definitely want it to rewind towards the front of the machine because of the way I have my machine set up in my office. Um, you can do it either way without it. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do here is click on copy print mode. When I do this one, I'm going to take the copy off, hit delete, and then I'm going to write in the behind here. I'm going to choose a different print mode. I'm going to go 1440 by 1440. RW non textile. And then click OK. Okay, now I haven't changed any settings because this is basically still just a copy of this one. I just renamed it. So what I'm going to do is double click on this new one that I just created. All right, and this gets me into some higher functions here. All right, your CMYK adjustments, I really don't play with these too often. I leave those at my shadows and midtones so that way it doesn't kind of tweak out my graphic because I can't visually see what it does here. All right, under separation curves, I don't really mess with those as well. Um, under max sync, another one that I don't mess with, ICC profiles are those uh, ones that have already been predetermined by our software programmer. But under printer options is where I can change some of the different stuff here. So under the resolution, these are all the crazy print modes that are available. All right, I don't suggest making a whole bunch of changes unless you get a little bit more advanced in there. All right, so what we'll do is we're going to take a look at some of these. Um, we have proofing, which is kind of a light print. We have large dots, which is a real saturated, a medium, and a small dot. All right, so what I'm going to change it to is a small dot. All right, so that way, because I want a real fine looking print uh, for like doing a stretch canvas to make it look like a piece of artwork. All right, so I'm going to choose this one right here. All right, this will stay the same. Feed adjustments and all these different things are other things that you can play with if you're having issues. All right, there's rewind adjustments, unidirectional mode or bidirectional or auto, just depending. All right, um, if you need help with setting any of these things, uh, definitely call into our support department. Uh, the video would be way too long if we go through an entire uh, explanation of everything in here. So just make sure to, if you, if you just kind of follow these easy steps that I'm talking about, you'll have pretty good results. All right, so then next we have our half tones, variable dot sizes, and some of the criteria and stuff like that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So, the only thing we really changed uh, in this print mode was the name of it, and then uh, the 1440 by 1440 small dot. So then I'll click Save. So now that's an available print mode that I can choose when I go into my uh, Q properties. So once I click Close here, I can. you notice that that Q is not listed up here, but if I hit these arrows, then it will come up over here. Like this was the one that I created for my white ink only, and then there's my non-textile. So from the non-textile, I'm going to double click it and I'm going to choose the print mode that I chose. The 1440 RW non-textile. So now it will use those settings to print the color out. Now, some of the other things when you're doing non-textile, something that's a little bit more advanced, and you might have to call in for clarification as well, is that within, say, the graphics program called Photoshop, when you have an image, uh, say, that you want to print, and you're doing it at the exact size of, say, a 16 by 20 canvas, okay? This 16 by 20 canvas, you will have to basically create, like, a template to print it to. Uh, to get a really more detailed explanation of this, uh, there will probably be another video a little bit later on on doing non-textiles, or you can call into our support department and uh, we can give you kind of a walkthrough of how to do this. Okay. But what, going back to what I was saying in Photoshop is that once you have a graphic, you will have to flatten your graphic out uh, so that way it's a single layer and then play with the opacity of that graphic and you would not uh, you will basically have to make it see-through so it's not going to print as much ink as if it was going onto a t-shirt. Uh, t-shirts are absorbent. The non-textiles are non-absorbent. 
uh, they basically are just hard surfaces. So by changing the opacity, taking it down to anywhere between 65 and 85 percent of what it would normally be, it would print a lighter layer of it, but it would ha still have the crispness of the uh, of the actual image on it. So that way, it would not push out as much ink uh, onto that substrate. Okay, so let's click OK here. All right, so those were kind of creating and manipulating some of our cues there. The next thing I'm going to go through is to um, create some special media, some special templates that we have. So we're going to go down to Devices, Manage Print Media. Under Manage Print Media, um, I have my three different templates here. The one I was telling you back at the beginning of this video is I was going to create a Viper 2 up same, so that way when I import one image, it drops it into both slots. All right, and the same thing with the 4 up. I'm going to create a 4 up same that when I import one image, it'll drop it into all four slots. Uh, kind of help you speed up production purposes. Because if I use just this regular 4 up template here, I would have to import the graphic four separate times and then make changes four separate times for spacing. So this just kind of speeds up the production. And then you can create as many custom templates if you want. Uh, you can also order templates uh, from our Platin company if you have custom jobs uh, and anything to that order. All right, so to make uh, an actual adjustment here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this Viper 2 up. So I'll highlight that one, make a copy of it, and then what I'll do is just kind of highlight over copy of and hit delete. And then I'll, at the end here, I'll just write the word same and then click OK. Then I'll have to go into that particular template by double clicking on it. Um, from here, I see all my measurements here. This is the size of the actual platen itself, 16 and a half by 29. All right, these are the two up. Uh, how they sit on top of it. So what I'm going to do here, you notice that this is slot one and this is slot two. So what I'll do is highlight slot two and then change its label to one. All right, and then click update. It is very important to click update. Now you notice that both the first and second one are both labeled one. So that way when I import one image, it will drop it into both slots. All right, so then I'll click save. All right, I'm going to do the exact same thing for my four up. So I'll double click on, or I'm sorry, I'll highlight this, click on copy, go over top of of the copy of, delete it, scroll down to the end of it, and click on, or type in same. Click OK, double click from there, and then I will change each individual slot to number one. So once it's highlighted, I click down one, update. Click on the third one, click down twice, to take it to number one and click update. Same thing for number four. And then click update. And then I'll click on save. So now I have a four up same platen as well. Then I'll click on close. And then just so you can see this, I'm gonna kick back over here. If I change any of these templates after I have imported an image, it will not change it. I would have to remove this job and then import it again, so that way it would drop it into both slots. So I'll use my black speed just to show you the example, and I'm going to zoom out. All right, so from here, I'm going to choose my Viper 2 up same, and then I'll pick a random graphic. I'll go with like my uh, 3D love here, click on open, and what it's going to do is drop two images in that are exactly the same. It's got a little bit more data associated with it, so that's why it's taking a little bit longer. And like I said before, if you start getting these boxes, if you don't want to see it again, 
you can just put the check mark, don't show this dialog box, click on Express, and then it will automatically drop them into the slots. So now you can see that I have the same image in there. If I click on one of them, I can make changes to it. I can, and it will change for both of them. Say I want to make it 10 inches tall. I type in 10, hit the Enter key. Now they're both 10 inches tall by 12 inches wide. Okay, And then there's the position of them. You notice that there's little boxes here. That's what these boxes represent. This is how tall the box is this way. This is how tall the box is this way. All right. This is the position of it. From the edge over here, it's 3.25 down, and it is a half inch down from this edge. Okay. So say I want it two inches down from the top of my shirt, which my shirt uh, collar would be hooped up with the collar up here, and then the sleeves over here and here, and the bottom of the shirt over here. And I want it two inches down from the collar. Hit two and enter. Boom and then both of them move. That's the kind of benefit of creating those uh, Viper 2-up same templates. Okay, so let's go ahead and remove this. Oh, and another thing before I move on, once this process is in everything and you check the costing of it, uh, it will give you the costing of only one of them because you're actually importing one image. It just happens to be placing it on uh, one template here. All right, so I'm gonna right click on this and hit remove or I could hit the remove button here as well, okay? And then always make sure that after you finish doing this stuff that you revert this back to the regular two up. So that way, because if you were only pinning a single shirt and it was showing two image, it would print ink on this empty platen. Like I said, there's no eyeballs. You're telling it what to do, so it will print whatever you tell it to print. Okay, and it does not understand human language. It has to be told electronically, FYI. All right, so from here, let me show you the ripping process. I'm going to right click on the job and go rip only. From rip only, you notice that it looks off center now. Remember that I put those check marks uh, to remove uh, white space from bottom and right. So that way it makes my document smaller. Okay, uh, so that way it has quicker processing. Okay, like I said before, the ripping process, uh, since we put those check marks next to the save spooled file, we only have to go through this once. Okay, but one of the benefits of ripping only is to give me time to hoop up my shirt, uh, get it level, and get it loaded into the machine. And then once that's done, the ripping process will already be done, and then I can right click on here or hit the uh, print job. Okay, so now it says holding, but the job is spooled. So this is a ready to print file. All right, some of the other stuff that we can do from here is we can check the costing of this print. We can right click on the job, go to properties, and then show for page content. Under show for page content, we will have, this will be all the general settings that I used for that. And then I will come over here and click on other. Under other is my costing. All right, for this particular print, it looks like I did not set the costing for this particular queue, or I set the costing after the fact. So let's go back in, remove this job, and make sure that the costing is set up. So I did uh, set the costing after I imported that job. Like I said before, anytime you make changes in here, you have to remove the job that's in there and then re-import it. So let's do this again, just to prove the point. So I'll go into baby girl. It's going to import my job here. I cannot rip it until it creates the preview. It's actually processing it right now as you're importing it. So once it gets in here, I'm going to right click on it, go to rip only. Once it is finished ripping, then I will go back in and check its costing again. The 
So you notice that this is taking a little bit of time. It definitely takes a little bit more time than it does to uh, do, say, a white shirt because it's having to process two layers, a white underbase and then the color going on top of it. Okay, so now we'll right click on this, go down to properties and then show for page content again. Click on other and then cost. So there's our print cost now. So this particular print will cost $3.23 in ink. Going back up here, it was going to go $3.09 for the white ink cost, all right? And then it's going to have 5 cents of yellow, 4 cents of magenta, 3 cents of cyan, and 2 cents of black, all right? The reason it's uh, so expensive for the white is because we're printing with four channels of the print head, whereas the colors have single channels individually for each one of these colors. The white prints, it's an eight channel print head, uh, and it splits it in half, four color and then four are white. So it's basically four times as much. Okay, we'll click OK off of that. And then if I was ready to print it, I could either right click, hit print, or I could click on my print button up here. And then if I, and after I've printed, I like the color results and I approve it. And then I want to be able to do this again at some other date, then I could right click on it and click on archive. Archive to disk or click my little file cabinet, which is also archiving. But this is what it would do. It would show it being archived. Once that is finished, I can even go ahead and remove this job. And then I can come back over here to say fi our job, restore job. What it will do is access that archive, and there's my archived job that I have. All right, so from here, I can click on this file, and then click on restore job. It'll bring it back into my RIP software as if I was just ripped it before. I'll close this out and it's the identical print job. Then I could right click on it and go print and it would be the exact same file. Same colors, same settings, same spacing, same everything. Okay. Another thing that we can view is the view raw data. View raw data is a nice little bit of code that the programmers did as kind of a diagnostic tool. Once I click OK out of here, it brings up this screen. All right. What I'll do, usually it'll come up to the top corner. So what I'll do is click on my little drop down menu for the scaling and make it a little bit smaller. Whenever you see this little line processing or your little uh, uh, swirly button here on the mouse, do not try to do anything else with it. It needs to think about this stuff. All right. And if so, it will crash this little program out because it's a lot of code that it's processing here. This is the actual dot pattern of the way it is going to print. Okay, let's zoom out a little bit more so it's not so big. I'm going to let it finish processing here. What this could be used for is say I was having little white dots up here above my DTG look. Um, I could come in here and view the raw data and see if there's actual white dots in the processed file. Or if there's not here in the processed file as I'm viewing right here, that means that it's basically not supposed to be there. All right. That means you're either getting something on your parchment paper when you're curing it, or there it's dirty underneath your head carriage and it's uh, like slinging drops of ink or something else is going on. So if you're getting weird stuff in your prints, this is like a diagnostic tool to see if uh, if it's actually in the data of the print, or and if you can't figure it out, that's what your support line is for. All right. So let's zoom into this. I'm going to kind of show you what you're looking at here. Let's zoom into like her eyeball. So the closer I get here, 
you'll notice that you'll start seeing the dot patterns. This is what your print head is spraying. And then I can actually come in here and say, turn off the um, all the black of the job, and then all the magenta of the job, and then all the cyan, and see where the yellow is overlapping and stuff like that. Uh, it's it's just a really cool little diagnostic tool. It's not to say that you have to do this for every image, but it's just something that you can take a look at uh, if you're using that. So what I'll do is just close this out. I can minus this up a little bit. And then as I zoom out, you can see the graininess of it. All right, and these are dot patterns. It's not going to give you a true respect of color. It's just where the dots are being placed. All right, so let's go ahead and close this out here. Okay, so I hope this video has been a little bit better for you uh, and demystifies some of the different uh, features within the RIP software here. Uh, definitely, if you have any questions about any of the stuff that we've gone over, please contact support and uh, we can uh, maybe clarify some things that you may have questions of. Uh, once again, thank you very much for choosing uh, DTG as your uh, direct to garment printer, and uh, we look forward to uh, helping you grow your business. Have a great day. Bye bye.